Well, this time, if you have a child that is six years of age or younger, they can meet our children's worker and back to head on back to Children's Church. And please, as the kids make their way out of the sanctuary, if you please take your copy of God's Word and turn to uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter uh, 1. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1. Uh, if you are a guest with us, we want to especially uh, welcome you. What we typically do here at uh, our church is we take a passage of Scripture and kind of walk through it, uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, uh, book by book, letting God's Word be the, the message of our text. Uh, these last three weeks, we've been kind of doing a, a doctrinal series on the Holy Spirit. We looked at how, how the Holy Spirit is our uh, our convictor, how he convicts us of our sin in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, he is our, our comforter. He, he assures us that we are children of God. His spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, not given a spirit of, of slavery, but a spirit of love and sonship. Uh, well, today we're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit is our consecrator, how he is the one who makes us holy. We pray it be an encouragement uh, to you. Uh, well, before I read this morning's text, I do want to just welcome uh, Riley and Hope back. Uh, Riley and Hope Lynch uh, went away to seminary. Riley's in seminary. Riley, Hope, wave. Uh, make sure you see them before they leave. Uh, and right next to them, we have Clarissa Zills. Clarissa was, was here last week, left, and came back. And uh, she is back for good now. So uh, those of you who were praying for her, she was in Indiana, and now she's back home. Uh, well done to get her back here by your prayers. Amen. Um, so we want to make sure that we honor the Lord uh, in how we not only uh, listen, but how we prepare our hearts to listen. So let's stand now as we hear the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one of these, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was forenoon before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in his last times for the sake of you, through who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, we, we do come again to praise your name. We thank you for a God that listens to our our prayers. Here's our confessions. And not only that, Lord, here's all our petitions. So God, we bring all our petitions before you now. Uh, Father, we, we first pray for the needs of our congregation. Lord, we pray for, for Judy Player as she is just uh, battling um, a dialysis and kidney failure. We pray, God, that you and your kindness would just be with, with Judy. And God, as we pray for Judy, we pray for Charlie. We pray that you would call him out of darkness, that you would uh, let him see your glorious light, the light of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. Help him see, Lord. Father, we pray for um, all those in our congregation who are struggling financially. Father, you know all their particular needs. We pray, God, that you would give them wisdom and strength and, and faith to trust in you in the midst of their, of their hardship. God, we, we pray that you'd be with all those who are, who are dealing with chronic pain, Father. Uh, Lord, those who are often so uh, unwilling to ask for prayer, Lord, because it's just so constant. We pray, God, that you would just be with them. Uh, specifically, Miss Connie, God, I pray that you would just meet her with your grace. We pray for Miss Pat Dawkins, God, as she is just continuing to, to, to struggle with health and just be able to make it. We pray, God, that you would just remind her of your goodness and your love and your mercy. Father, we rejoice uh, with you in bringing all our college students back. We thank you so much for the vital part they are to our body. God, we pray as they begin their, their semester, God, we pray that you would mark them um, apart, that you would set them apart by your uh, spirit, Lord, uh, to live lives of holiness and righteousness. God, we pray that their time here at Park, God, would be um, vital for their development as, as believers in Christ. Father, we thank you so much for all our Sunday school teachers who labor week in and week out uh, to teach God. I pray that they would just see that their labors are, are valuable, Lord. And I pray that you would encourage each one of them today for their work. Father, we thank you so much for how the gospel just goes out from us. God, it goes to all the world. So God, I pray that the gospel would go forth in um, 
Albania today. God, we pray that the gospel would be rich there. Uh, as our dear sister Sarah is serving there, God, I pray that you would use her, Lord, mightily for the goodness of your name. Father, we also just pray for our own land. We pray for those who are our leaders. We pray specifically for our Supreme Court. God, as they make decisions that, that affect all of us, Father, uh, we pray, God, that they would, would make decisions with fear, Lord, as we even see in this text, that they would understand that they um, will one day meet you, God. And because of that, Lord, that you judge impartially uh, according to each one's deeds, God, that they would in, enact laws and, and, and make uh, decide cases, God, uh, that would uh, be in, in a way that would understand that they would, uh, too, would face a judge. Father, we thank you so much for how the gospel goes forth in uh, other churches uh, outside of our own. We, we pray for Remedy Church this morning. We thank you so much for, uh, for Fudd and his love of the gospel, uh, his love of Christ. God, as he grieves uh, the passing of his own mother, Lord, I pray that you would just strengthen him in, in a profound way. God, I pray that you would have the, the church there surround him and encourage him, God. We pray that even now, as he's gone from the pulpit to, to, to grieve, God, that you would uh, bless that congregation as Jordan heralds your word. Father, we, we thank you so much for uh, this hour, this sacred moment right now where we get a chance to hear the word of God, Lord. So I pray that as I, as I announce, God, the gospel, as I announce uh, and preach your word, that you would preach through me by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that as Jesus Christ is lifted up and is extolled and exalted, that you would draw men and women unto yourself. God, that you would take our congregation as we behold the glory of Christ, as we think about the wondrous cross, God, that we would be transformed from one degree of glory to the next, God, that we would, would see the, 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 the importance and the urgency to live holy lives, God. God, that this sermon would not come across as laying down guilt upon them, but God, that they would give them hope that you can change them, that you can make them holy as you are holy. So, Father, I pray in, in this sacred hour that you would speak, uh, not only for our good, but for the glory of your name, God, and that you would bear fruit in our congregation, spiritual, eternal fruit. Uh, we ask this in the name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Rock Hill uh, is known as Football City USA. Many of you already know this, but uh, Rock Hill has more uh, um, athletes and professional football than any other, other city in uh, the United States, uh, so which means there's a lot of people who are coming to recruit uh, our uh, high school athletes from our, our town to go to play college football. Now, believe it or not, I played college football myself. And I remember those days when you were a recruit. They would come and they would tell you how uh, you were going to be a starter. Uh, I was recruited to play tight end at the University of Pennsylvania, and they're kind of all these dreams, like you are going to be uh, on the field, and you're going to be like number one. I'm like, this is going to be great. I'm going to go there. And you get there, then you realize you're last in the depth chart. <laughs> and uh, there's really no chance of you getting the field because the, the best uh, uh, player on the team is right in front of you and is a sophomore. So you're really uh, out of luck. Um, well, the coaches saw something in me, uh, so they realized that we don't want him – uh, to be a uh, tight end anymore. We want him to be a, a fullback. But not just a, a fullback. They wanted to set me apart to the exclusive jumbo package for goal line form formations. Okay? I was the backup goal line fullback. Affectionately known as the BGF. Not to be mistaken as BGD, but BGF. The backup goal line Fullback. Didn't matter what I wanted to call myself. Didn't matter what I wanted to play. I, I only played that particular role. Everything had changed. I had to learn a new position. I had to learn a new stance, a new a language, new vocabulary. It was still me, but I had a very different purpose. I was set apart to this specific role. Well, in, in that in that same way, I believe that's what happens with us when we become Christians. This idea of, of consecration is that we are set apart unto the Lord. So we have to learn a new vocabulary. Uh, we have to learn a new, new technique. We have to learn how a, a very new way to live, new lifestyle, new values, and really a new family. It gives us a new purpose. We are consecrated unto God. We have been set apart to the Lord. Now, if you look back with us in our, in our text, you know, you, you notice when we read that text, we didn't really see a lot of the Holy Spirit. But what I want you to see is, is, is the verse 12 that that I often pray before I preach. 
Uh, this is the after Peter kind of talks of the gospel in chapter 1. He, he says concerning the salvation, beginning in verse 10, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, search and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. So the, the prophets were, were looking through the scriptures. Who was going to be the Messiah? Who was going to be the Christ? And it says it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, but us. In the things that have been announced to you, the, the gospel of Christ has been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. The gospel that Jesus Christ saves by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. So because the Holy Spirit has, has come into your life and you've understood that who, who Jesus Christ is, his role in your life now is to help form you and to help set you apart. So when you give your life to Jesus, you are declared or officially consecrated as holy. You are declared that way. So the way God views you as, as positionally as holy. But he also works in our life to make us functionally holy. So we actually live a life that is different than transformed. We move from a, from a tight end to a, to a fullback, to the BGF, where our whole lives are, are now changed by the power of the Spirit. And I think from this text, I think we can see there are six different ways. Um, I guess that's right, six different ways I think the Holy Spirit can consecrate us. So if you want to follow along in the outline provided for you, the Holy Spirit, one, consecrates us for the future. Consecrates us for the future. Look at verse 13. Therefore, because we have this gospel, this great gospel of salvation, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the command in verse 13 is to set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you when Christ comes. Now, the, the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be brought to you in one of two ways. When you die as a believer in Christ and you are resurrected and you meet the Lord, right? you will see a, a, a glimpse of the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the glory that will be brought to you, uh, or you will be brought to in one sense. But the other one is, is that his return. When Christ returns fully, bringing his glory on the earth. What, what Peter is saying is that you need to live for eternity today. And when you live for eternity today, you will be changed. You, you've heard the saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, what Peter is saying is put all your eggs in one basket. Put all your life in the hope that will be revealed when Jesus Christ returns. That's the command. That's what we are called to do. And then he tells us how to do it. He gives us two participles, right, that, that modify the, the, the command of set your hope fully. And the two particles are preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Let's take the second one first and then go back to the first. So we, we are called to, to, to consecrate ourselves to be for the future, to set our hope fully on what's going to come. And the first thing we want to do is we want to be sober-minded. To be sober-minded is to be seriously considering truth and their implications. And I think we don't do this enough in our day. We don't think about the ramifications of theological ideas in the scriptures and how they impact our everyday lives. So if you want to be sober-minded, you will think about the incarnation, how Jesus Christ became, took on flesh and dwelt among us, and how the incarnation impacts how we treat our family, or how we work at our, at our jobs, or how we witness to those in our classes. We will think about how the, the hypostatic union, how Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man uh, impacts how, how, how we deal with temptation, how we overcome lust or greed. We will think that because Jesus Christ has been seated at the right hand of God, it gives us help to how, how we deal with our own anxiety, our own fear, our own worry and concern about our children or our finances. See, our theology should drive our methodology. That's true in the church. What we believe should, should um, shape how we live as a congregation. And if you're a visitor here, that's what we want. We want the Word of God and our theology from the Word of God to shape every facet of our church life together. But that should not only be true for the church. That should be true for you. Your theology should drive your life to be alert 
To be aware, the, the opposite of sober-minded, really kind of, to kind of be drunk, to be drunk, to, to be not sure of what's happening, not to have a, a clear mind of what, 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 is, what is seen. If you are going to set your mind fully on the, on the Lord, you, you have to be sober-minded to think seriously about the things of God. Secondly, you have to prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. So, uh, as I've grown as a, as a, um, a man, uh, really as, I, as I've aged as a man, uh, if I want to compete in athletics anymore, I have to do a lot of stretching beforehand, right? Uh, if I don't stretch and I don't prepare myself for the action of the game, I will do what? I will hurt something. Uh, there's always, a, the, the, every time I try to play basketball with college students, I end up hurting something, an ACL, an ankle, um, a hamstring, a groin. Um, it's just been, it's been bad, okay? I should, I should really prepare our minds. And really what, what, what happens is, is that our minds are a muscle. And we need to stretch our minds and prepare them for the, for the action, for the, for the battle of, of the day. We live under constant attack. When you leave this place, you are going to be bombarded with, uh, with, with the world. Bombarded with the, the, the attack of your own flesh and, and the devil. And what the devil wants to do, what this world wants to do, is make you kind of dismiss it or make you unprepared. Uh, you've seen uh, competition where someone was unprepared for battle and they were defeated. We don't want to be unprepared. We have to be prepared for action. So are we stretching our minds for hope? Romans 15.4 says, For whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, that we should be always tethered to, we might have hope. So let's, let's make this real. Okay, how, do, how do we make this real in our lives? Not just you know, this, this idea of a sermon. So when a friend says something to you that offends you, or when your spouse does something to offend you, Right, this never happened to me in my marriage, but if that happens in your marriage with your spouse, um, what are you going to do? Are you prepared to overlook an offense? Are you prepared to quickly forgive? Or are you prepared to confront them in love, as Matthew 18 says? Are, are you prepared to pray for their repentance? Or are you unprepared? When you are offended by someone, whether that's in traffic or in your own home, that you want to lash out in anger, you want to withdraw from a friendship, or you just want to embitter yourself about how you are justified in your actions and they are, are wrong. See, if, 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 if when, you're not, when you're offended and you're not prepared to act like a Christian, guess what? You won't act like a Christian. So when you go out there and live in the world, you want to be prepared. How? It's because we're setting our hope fully on when Christ will return. We're putting all our eggs in the basket of, of, the, of the return of Christ. When we think about heaven, we will be changed here. So we're consecrated for the future. Number two, the Holy Spirit consecrates us from the past. From the past. Look what the text says in verse 14. As obedient children. The word obedient here is, is a key text. What it's really trying to say, I think both verse in verse 14 and in verse 22, is when you become a Christian. So as obedient children, like as those who have, have chosen to follow Christ, to hear his word, be baptized, and follow him in, in the church. When you become a Christian, it says what? Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So we have been set apart as obedient children. We now are, are different. We have to now live different. We belong to God. So he says it first negatively. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. We know God. We know his word. We know his truth. We know his, his life. We can't go back. It's kind of like uh, Alice in Wonderland. Once you kind of go down the rabbit hole, you can't see things clearly. Or if you take the modern generation, ish, the, the blue pill. Or is it the red pill in the Matrix? That was funny. <laughs> see? People laughed. Um, you can't go back, okay? I mean, even for me, like if I was moved to fullback and then I started showing up at, and running tight end drills, they'd be like, uh, Keen, what are you doing? You're over there. It doesn't make sense for you to be here anymore. You, need, you belong over there. Well, listen, if you are, are a Christian, the way you used to live doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't belong. It doesn't fit. And notice what it says. It says the, the passions of your former ignorance. 
We used to not know how to live, and we had passions that were inside of us driving us to live a certain way. But now that we have been, been awakened by the Spirit, what? We're called to live different. He says the same thing in 1 Peter 2.13, abstain from the passions of your flesh that wage war against your soul. So a simple question, where are you tempted from your former life? What, 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 what from the past is always kind of creeping back in to, to try to lure you and, and win you back to your old ways? Is it money? Lust? Is this desire for reputation to be well thought of? The world wants to conform you and wants you to swim in their stream. So, I've never heard, uh, probably until about three weeks ago, I've never heard of the game Fortnite. I know that I'm probably out there in, in, in La La Land. I've never heard of it until a couple weeks ago. Um, we were at, at a playground this, this week with my, with my son, and a little boy came up to Johnny and said, uh, How old are you? Nine. Do you play Fortnite? Hmm. That's an interesting opening, right? What's your age? Do you play Fortnite, right? And I, I'm, not, I'm not making a comment on Fortnite, okay? Because I don't think, really know nothing about it. What I am saying is that if everybody else is doing it, should we? If everybody else in the world that has been being, being swimming in that stream, should we do the same? Whether that's a video game or, or our, 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 our Netflix, okay? If everybody else is doing it, should we do the same? Because we're not called to be conformed, are we? But everything in this world, the pressure of this world is trying to, to squeeze us so that we would be like the world. But we're called not to be conformed to this world, but to, to renew our minds, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so we can test and approve what God's will is, His good, perfect, and pleasing will. So if everybody else is doing it, you should pause and say, should I? I've been set apart. I'm called to be distinct from the world. I don't want to swim in the same stream. We're consecrated from our past. Three, we are consecrated in the present, actively right now. Verse 15. This is what Peter says positively. So not to be conformed to the passions of your former ways, but, verse 15, as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So positively, you should be holy. You should live for the Lord. You should live as set apart. Now, I think some may be thinking, well, pastor, this is starting to sound all, all, a lot like the law, a lot like works. Just wait for it. You know, we we, we want to look like the one who called us. Hear that? The one who calls. We now represent God to the world. We are his ambassadors to this world. Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us to show us God. That's what John 1 says, that we did not know God, but Jesus Christ showed God to us, showed grace to us. And then God sent his Holy Spirit so that we could not only um, believe, but that we could actually live like him in this world. Christians should look a certain way. And how many times have we seen people move away from the church or move away from, from Christ because they, they look at the lives of Christians that don't reflect Christ? Now, if that's you, if you're here, and that's usually the excuse you use to, to not follow Christ, that's a bad excuse. It's a cop-out, right? You're not dealing with your own sin. So deal with your own sin first. We all have struggles. We'll get there. But listen, we want to represent Christ to this world. We want to represent the character of Christ. Kindness, gentleness, love. You know, I think we know all the caveats of what makes us not holy. But let's just stop for a second. We know the expectation God has for us. So, truth talk. In your life right now, what do you need to stop doing? Period. Don't make excuses for it. Stop doing the thing that makes you not look like Christ. But notice what it says here. It says, he who calls you. See, what happens in our consecration, in our being set apart, it is the Holy One of God that calls you 
distinct, that calls you to be separate. Even this past week, we're seeing preachers in our own backyard who will say that, that God does not have the power to call you. That Jesus Christ does not have the power to set you apart. It is untrue. Categorically untrue. And a heresy. And you should never listen to someone who says that. It is a lie from the pit of hell. I cannot say it any strongly. Stronger. The Bible says God calls you. And see why this is so beautiful for us. Just let me read you a few passages. First Thessalonians. You can just mark these down. I'm going to read them. Just mark them down. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. The one who calls you to be holy, guess what? Will make you holy. Philippians 1 6, and I'm sure of this, that he began a good work and you will carry it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 12 and 13, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in your absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Or if you want to maybe have a longer extended thought on this idea of God sanctifying you in the present, read Galatians chapter 3, when Paul was chastising the church, saying, you were saved by, by the Spirit, by grace. Why, why are you trying to be holy by, by the flesh? It doesn't make sense. So let me just say this. If you're here and you're struggling with sin, and you already feel the weight of this message kind of fall upon you. Know this. God will finish his work. You are not as holy as you want to be. You are not as set apart as you want to be. But God has promised in his word to complete the work. He'll move you from one degree to another degree. To another degree. And so often we look at our lives and we wish we were farther along in the path. God is at work in your life. So turn again from the things that are trying to lure you back. Turn again and just trust that if you behold Christ and you run after Him, He will make you holy. Now, if you're struggling with the sin of others, you're looking at their lives and you just think they should be farther along the path, than they should be. That they, my children should, have, should know this by now. My grandchildren, a fellow church member, should be farther along. Can I just tell you that you need to have trust that the Holy Spirit is working in their lives. Let us not look down upon someone else because they do not meet your standard of holiness. You don't meet God's standard of holiness. Chill. Okay? Just chill. God's working in their lives. God's working in their lives. So just trust him. The one who called you will complete his work. The one who called them will complete their work. Let's just be confident that God's going to do that in all of us. Four, the Holy Spirit consecrates us by the gospel. I love this. What a great and glorious passage beginning in verse 17. Uh, we, we begin this beautiful picture of the gospel. Verse 17, and, and if, if, and if, you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. That if there is really important. So, if you are living a life, not just struggling with sin, but if you're kind of giving yourself over to sin. Like, you, you know, you're sinning, you know you're sinning, and you don't care. If that's you, this is that, 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 that word if there. And if you call him father, meaning if you call yourself a Christian and are not living like one, remember that the Father judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Meaning when you stand before him, you're going to be judged fairly. And you're either going to be judged by, we see here in the passage, by the work of Christ, or on your own work. 
But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a way that Christians, if we know the Lord, are called to conduct ourselves. The second half of verse 17. We're called to conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Meaning that we are called to live until uh, the Lord calls us home, or we are, are aliens or strangers in this land. Our final home is heaven. Our destination is heaven. That's our, where we're setting our hope. While we're living here in this life, we're called to live with fear. Now, that fear is both a reverent awe, fear. God is magical, right? That standing at the Grand Canyon and kind of being in awe of the magnitude of it. But it's also a fear, meaning I don't want to, I don't want to disobey my father. Kind of that childly, I don't want my dad to be displeased with me. That's the, that's the kind of fear as well. We, I think sometimes we always want to go back to like the, the, the reverent fear. But listen, there's also a fear. I don't want to upset my dad. I don't want to upset my father. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So I want to live in a life that's honorable. And by God's grace, I've had many conversations with you when you're coming up to a decision. What do I do? Do I do this or do I do that? And really what you're saying is, listen, I'm, I want to conduct myself in fear in this situation. I want to honor the Lord, and I'm not exactly sure how. What's the best way I can honor the Lord in this situation? That's an attitude of, of fear. And when we do that, we, remember, we, we have been transformed by knowledge, right? Not according to our former ignorance where we did not know. Now we know something. And what do we know? Verse 18. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers. You have been bought back. So the, the way you used to live, you have been bought back with the blood of Christ. You were in slavery. An enormous debt for what you had done wrong. And God paid it all. What a glorious picture. But not just He paid it all to, to pay for your sin, but He paid it all to, have, to live an empty life from the futile ways from your, from your forefathers. I think we can look at that in several different ways. The, I think maybe the primary way here, He's speaking to, to an audience who has a, a, a Jewish background, that those who, who trusted in their works for salvation, that is a fool's errand. If you think that you're going to go to heaven because of your church attendance or because of your church giving, you are sadly mistaken. That is a futile way of thinking. It's empty. You can't earn your way by following the law. I think that's what he's getting at here. But it's also, you're not bound by the way you were raised. By God's grace, some of you were raised in godly homes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You were raised to love the Lord, to honor Him with your life. Some of you weren't. But guess what? You've been ransomed from that former way. You've been ransomed from the life that you used to live. Your old life is now dead. You are alive in Christ. You've been bought back. And notice how you've been bought back or what you've been bought, bought back with. Not with perishable things such as silver and gold. Even if you're taking a shot at money here, how often do we live for more money? But listen, that's perishable, right? This world is perishing. But no, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. I mean, if you're a Christian, how often do you think about the precious blood of Christ? It is precious, no. It is precious, so precious to redeem you, like a lamb without blemish or spot. It kind of throws us back to the to the Old Testament, how how Israel would would slaughter a lamb, a perfect lamb, to, as a, as an example for one who was uh, the blood that was spilled for the sins of Israel. We see that primarily pointing to the Messiah in Isaiah chapter fifty three. And we see that in the, in the New Testament, in Revelation, where the whole the lion of the tribe of Judah, I looked and there was a lamb who was slain. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, that's what he's talking about here. Jesus was that lamb who was slain for us. His blood was spilled so yours would not have to be. And, and Peter just drives this home. This is not just some random thought that the Lord kind of made up one day. In verse 20, it says that he, Jesus, was foreknown. Before the foundation of the world. Meaning that Jesus was the eternal Son of God. He was the eternal second person of the Trinity. Uh, I've talked to numerous people throughout my time here in, in the Baptist world. And uh, many people think that Jesus Christ was, was kind of created as, as a boy uh, in Bethlehem. As a baby. As if that was something new. Well, no, that, that, is, that is not true. He was not created. He was the eternal Son of God. He is the creator of the world. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God. 
Jesus Christ was shown in the last days for you, so that you could believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory. Raised Him from the dead, speaking of His resurrection after His death. Gave Him glory, seated at the right hand of God. And look, look, at, look at that, so that. So that your faith and your hope are in God. Your faith and your hope are in God. Listen, you're going to become holy. You're going to conduct yourselves with lot in, with in, in, you're going to conduct yourselves with fear during your time during your, as an exile. You're going to conduct yourselves in holiness and, and righteousness by faith and hope in God. It's not that we're going to kind of like white knuckle it, right? I'm going to finally become holy by, by trying really hard. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you're going to become holy when you trust Christ, when you trust His promises, when you believe what He says. Holiness is never about your works. It is always about the work of God in and through you. Holiness is never about your works. It is about the work of God in and through you. Number five, the Holy Spirit consecrates you in the church. He consecrates you in the church. Look at verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. And I think what he's trying to say there is that you believed, right? You're, you're converted. Just like the, the same way as obedient children. You have been converted. You, you're no longer in your sins. You have been become obedient children. And, and to show yourself as, an, as, a, as a believer in Christ, how do you do that? Well, his, historically and biblically, you, you, you're baptized. You believe, and then you are obedient, meaning that you follow him in what he has said. You are baptized in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you join yourself with a church. We see that in the second half of verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for purpose, a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So he kind of reiterates his point. So you're saved for a, a, a sincere brotherly love. And then he says, do this more and more. Just do it from a pure heart. Love each other. You know, John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says this. He says, a new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another another. It's sad when I see churches aimed at just getting people in the pews. That is such a weak, weak vision. It is such a small thing compared to what God really wants you to do. God wants us to be a transformed community. He wants us to be a holy Nation, a, a righteous people. And how we love each other, how we care for each other, He wants that to, to radiate to the world that Christ is real. He wants to use our relationships with each other, old and young, black and white, right? This, this, this odd mix of people who are sinners, who are really striving hard to, to love each other for the glory of Christ, He wants to use that to bring people who are dead in their trespasses and sins and far from God into eternal security in Christ. That is beautiful. Do we have that vision for our church? Do we want to give ourselves to each other so that the world outside these walls would know Christ is real? We want to show the radical power of the gospel and draw people to Christ. You know, by God's grace, I believe the Lord is doing that in our congregation. You know, this past week, we've had several visitors. By the way, if you're a visitor, thank you for coming. Uh, it's been really encouraging uh, to me and uh, to our whole congregation that we've had more visitors. Praise the Lord. Um, and I think this past week, I've heard just several unique things from visitors that, that, that just show that God is moving in our body. That God is, is consecrating us. He is setting us apart. You know, one, one comment was after a service, someone just said, I want what they have. What, what, what you're saying is, I want more of the Spirit's work in my own life as I see in them. Beloved, can we just praise the Lord for that? What the Lord is doing in our body is, is, a, is a miracle. 
It is, it, is the, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is miraculous what we see happening in our, in our midst. And I, I pray as, as Peter did. Love one another from pure heart. Do this more and more. But that those comments could continue to come. Lastly, the Holy Spirit consecrates through the Word. Through the Word. How all this happens. And this is why we structure our services the way we do. As I mentioned before, our theology drives methodology. One of the reasons why our church has the Word of God being the, the center part of our service. and The, the time we spend in the Word of God is, is, is primary. The message that we preach wants to come from the Word of God. Why? It's because of this verse. Verse 23. Through the end of the chapter. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. Now remember... Verse 12. Verse 12 says that men preached, announced the word, but who preached to you? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit preached this living, abiding word. Not with perishable seed, but imperishable seed. A seed that will never die. But when the Holy Spirit, the seed of the Holy Spirit is planted in your heart, guess what? It's going to grow. God is going to consecrate you. If you are a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever you're dealing with today, you will not deal with forever. Or you may deal with that same struggle, but just in a smaller way. If you are dealing with anything particular, here's my encouragement to you. Whatever sin you're dealing with, get the Word of God and pour your life into it. It is living and it is active. And when we're in the Word of God, and when we're in the community of God, the, the, the church, what happens is the, the, the dross is kind of burning away, right? And when the dross is burning away, we are being formed and shaped and, and fashioned into the image of Christ. God has already promised He will do it. He's given us means in His Word to do it. But the challenge for us is will we trust Him? Will we take the Word of God at, its, at face value and grow and grow, and grow, and grow, until he calls us home. Father, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that consecrates us, that sets us apart. We thank you for the gospel that we have come to believe by the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the church that you have formed by your Spirit, setting us apart. Uh, we thank you for the word that you have given us by your Spirit to form and shape us. God, we pray that we would be a church that is consecrated unto God, that we are set apart for you, living like the one who called us. Lord, you are holy. We pray you would make us holy as well. For the glory of your name. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing this one last song which I just was informed about, um, which is a simple song, which is a wonderful uh, way to end this message, uh, and really to end this series, is to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Uh, Hymn 320. That's what the Holy Spirit's role is, that we would turn our eyes upon Jesus.